What's up, guys? On behalf of Dive Bomb Industries, I want to thank all of you that made our one-day sale exclusive to the listeners of the Foul Front such a great success. Your willingness to spend your hard-earned money and put your confidence in our products means a lot, and we really appreciate it. We know there are many great decoy manufacturers out there, and we are grateful you chose Dive Bomb Industries. Buckle up. This fall is going to be one hell of a ride. Welcome to the Foul Front Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, where our goal is to recruit and educate new hunters while entertaining the rest of you. Without new hunters and the mentorship of those more seasoned, this passion as we know it faces an uncertain future. So get the word out, turn the volume up, and enjoy the show, because you're on the Foul Front. This week's episode is brought to you by Dive Bomb Industries, the fastest growing, most affordable decoys on the market with unmatched customer service. Visit them online at divebombindustries.com, on Instagram or Facebook at Dive Bomb Industries. Or go ahead and give them a call anytime, seven days a week at 314-322-7468. And go ahead and use the promo code FOWLFRONT, all under case with a space in between foul and front, for 10% off your next purchase of Dive Bomb Decoys. This episode also brought to you in part by Hunt Hickory Creek. And new to Hunt Hickory Creek this year is their Central Kansas Lodge. They're going to be running hunters from the end of October all the way through January. And their main hunting area is located between Kavira National Refuge and Cheyenne Bottoms. Now, Central Kansas is a special place for waterfowl hunting. And during the peak migration, these refuges hold hundreds of thousands, if not close to millions of birds at one time. So for your chance of a hunt of a lifetime, head on over to HuntHickoryCreek.com because if you're going to hunt Kansas... Hunt Hickory Creek. Hey everyone, Austin here with Colorado Custom Game Calls. Are you looking for a duck or goose call for next season? Are you a budget hunter? Well guys, let us know over here at Colorado Custom Game Calls. We provide high quality calls at affordable prices. We are budget hunter friendly. Whether it be the colors of the resin, the colors of the band, do you want something in your call? It's your call. You get to build it from the ground up. So guys, make sure you go check us out on our Facebook and Instagram and on the web at coloradocustomgamecalls.com. All right, we have a great episode for you today. We got Brad Harris, uh, the co-host of AVNX TV, and I tell you what, not only do we get a good peek behind the curtains on what it goes into filming, but we talk about, um, you know, how to pack out a trailer and kind of what goes on behind the scenes with, um, you know, Fred Zink and the crew over there at AVNX, but also. We get some pretty good tips on uh, how to quickly brush a blind and how to utilize those A-frames that we see all the time. Um, Not to mention just awesome conversation with a a great down-to-earth, conservation-minded hunter um, that has a lot of experience afield. So let's uh, let's hear a little word from uh, a couple of our sponsors, and then we'll get into the episode. Did you know that tagging migratory game birds after you harvest them is a federal law? Did you know it's being enforced in all 50 U.S. states and Canada? Well, Toe Tags LLC has just the solution for migratory game bird hunters, a waterproof tagging solution that meets all federal tagging laws. With several options of tags and custom tags available, this is perfect for all hunters. Whether you're an outfitter or a weekender, for just a few cents a day, you can ensure you're in compliance with the law. Contact Toe Tags LLC at www.toetagsllc.com. Hey, I want to tell you about a hunt logging system that my friend Elliot from Freelance Duck Hunting has created. It's a site called Freelance Hunt Stats. At Freelance Hunt Stats, you can record information from each day's hunt, which allows you to remember what took place each day, and it also helps you improve your future hunting success. It's easy to use, it tracks game totals, weather patterns, shooting information, bird averages, and a lot more. So go to FreelanceHuntStats.com and create an account to start logging your hunts today. Also, be sure to head over to DocsOutdoorSupplies.com. They've got tons of motion decoys and anything else that you need to be in the outdoors. So, for your 10% off, use FowlFront18 at your checkout at DocsOutdoorSupplies.com. And this week's episode is also brought to you by Goose Ninja Call Lanyards. Lanyards so tough, you could pull your truck with them. All right, today uh, on the podcast, we've got Brad Harris, and uh, Brad Harris is a vice president of a bank, and he is a farmer, and most importantly, while we're having him on the show today, he is the co-host of AVNX TV. Um, 
Brad, you want to go ahead? Does that does that description uh, fit you well? It, it does fit uh, fit me fairly well. Uh, banker, farmer, um, trying my hand in a little golf and roping, and and most importantly, um, love to waterfowl hunt. Well, awesome. Uh, when did you when did you get into hunting? You know, I was <clears throat> I started hunting with. Um, Quail hunting was really big, uh, very popular. We had a great population of birds when I was younger. Uh, eight, nine years old, I'd go out with my dad behind his Britneys, and we would go hunt. Um, my dad was not a big duck hunter at the time, but as the quail population is kind of, I guess, as I started to hunt more, the quail population was going down. Thankfully, the turkey population was at, the, at that time also picking up. Um, the duck hunting was getting better here, so we transitioned from being upland bird hunters to uh, to turkey hunters and waterfowl hunters. Now I notice on here, so you've been you've actually hosted several TV shows in the past. Uh, do you want to kind of talk about how you got into um, outdoor TV and all that? Um, I, I got really lucky. We are fortunate to farm some really good river bottom ground. Uh, that thankfully has some really nice gravel bars on it. And when everything freezes up, it's phenomenal duck hunting. With that said, I got really lucky getting inter- introduced into the uh, the TV show world. We were at it as actually we'd, we'd, a good friend of mine, Nick Smith, and I, <clears throat> we'd been out, shot a uh, limit of mallards on the river one morning. We were actually just, we stopped at the gas station to grab some coffee and and actually the producers of American Bird Hunter were in there. They had had a pretty rough go of it that morning. They were hunting with a guy named Roy Carter, who uh, traditionally has phenomenal hunting. And they uh, they had been at it for a couple of days and just and weren't having any luck. We had talked to Roy, told him we were shooting them pretty good. So their next morning, they actually came and hunted with us. We hunted with them for uh, for three days, got a couple of good TV shows for them. And just just by chance, stayed in touch with them. And they came out and hunted a couple more times. Once I graduated college, they uh, they asked if I'd be interested in doing uh, some sales for them. Wolf Creek Productions is the name of their production company. Started doing some sales for them, and then hosted the uh, the American Bird Hunter Show for three years. Nice. After that was in about probably 2010 to 2013, 14 time frame. Okay, awesome. And so then after American Bird Hunter, you went on to... So I, I uh, when I did the American Bird Hunter show, I also helped with a TV show called American Archer with Tom Nelson um, and Outdoor America with a guy named Steve Gruber. I do archery hunts for both of those places, or both those shows. Um, got to kind of travel all over. And awesome. then <clears throat> is I I've known Fred Zink for... Oh, since I, it's been 20 years I've known him, and he'd seen some of the shows we'd been doing out at my place. We, we've always been in contact, and they were kind of having a rough go out in western Kansas. He called me, come out. He came out um, about 2000, probably 13, the first time they hunted out here, and they've been coming every year since, and, and we've been, been great friends. Awesome, awesome. So... I mean, often I think we see how – like we think how amazing it would be to get paid to hunt on TV. What are what are we not seeing? It's, it's a grind. Um, every – you know, getting up and hunting every day is great. Uh, if you get to go with your buddies and, and there's no expectations kind of for the day, you're not – you don't have to do something. Uh, but when the hunting's not uh, – it, it's kind of like guiding, I guess. When you know the hunting's not going to be the best – but you still got to get up and go. It can really be a daily grind. Um, and just, you know, timing is kind of everything on those hunts. You really need to, uh, planning those hunts is not the best. You kind of just need to go on a whim. And when you can't do that, it, uh, it can be difficult. Right. And so I was thinking, you know, that this was a whole, you know, you had a plan when you, you know, go to produce these shows or plan them out and, you know, you choose, okay, we're going to hit up this farm here, we're going to hit up that farm here. you want to kind of talk about how you you go about setting up these hunts and kind of the whole logistics behind, you know, getting on birds and following weather and, like, how do you know which state you're going to hit when? Um, you know, thankfully Fred's got a, a long list of contacts all over the, uh, the central flyway. 
um, really every flyway for, for that. And so what we do is we kind of have an idea who we're going to hunt with, uh, where we're going to go, whether that's Canada or, or you know, in the U.S. here, in the central flyway. <clears throat> and we will stay in contact with everybody. You know, every duck hunter is watching the weather every night. They're on AccuWeather checking the 15-day forecast, hoping a front's coming. And, and so that's what we do. Just watch the weather. And once you really know that front's starting to uh, to really form, really going to come through, kind of isolate which areas you think may be the best, and, and just keep in contact with everybody. And then once uh, once it gets to be a day or two out, have the trailer packed and ready and, and ready to leave at a moment's notice. Okay, so you, you kind of do these in, in smaller segments. It's not one big, long countrywide tour kind of thing that i'm what well, it, it of. can be um so they, they'll be early season it tends to be smaller trips um later season um you know a lot of times fred will come out here after christmas we start here um we spend a lot of new years here and then go to either you know central kansas or or central oklahoma after that um and that can be that starts to be where you get a 30-day trip and that's when it can really really be a grind yeah now for uh some of my friends that weren't out there um and they don't believe me but we were we were hunting along the uh the the middle loop river this last season um i think it was around christmas time and i swore i saw the uh avian x truck uh and trailer uh roll past me on our way out uh were you guys in nebraska this season um, the, I, I did not get to make that trip, uh, but, but Fred and them were out there for, for a bit. Yes. All right. See, so for anybody that, uh, for anybody, any of my buddies out there that said, ah, we don't believe you, Ben. I definitely saw you guys, uh, saw you guys out there. So you definitely saw the mega cab, big black mega cab yep. and trailer for sure. Yep. So for sure. Okay. So, uh, specifically what's your role? during this planning portion? Um, so my role is, is I have kind of, I guess, a separate list of contacts that I, I you know, I'm keeping in touch with constantly. Um, and the good thing about Fred is is I've learned a lot from him on, on how to do the TV show side of things. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing is he, the group of guys he, he talks with daily, they give him 100% honest reports. These are not guys that just want to be on TV. They uh, they want to give him the, the information he needs to make a decision or or myself and and you get to go the, we get to go the best place um, we think the best options you know the best possibilities I guess for for filming a show um, it, that's that's the uh, that's the end goal is you know good TV but having those good good resources is is invaluable. Okay, awesome. Devin, I know you wanted to jump in here for a second. Yeah, so uh, I think probably some of the listeners are curious. Are all your guys' hunts um, pretty much like guided, or do you guys do some freelance, um, or how does um, that all work out? So we, we hunt with some outfitters. Um, so the one thing that we do uh, – <clears throat> we, we, a lot of times we, you know, we'll, we'll be with an outfitter or be in the same area outfitter – they don't always guide us, um, you know, so we go up with Grant Kuypers up in, in Saskatchewan, and we won't, uh, we don't take up any guides, um, you know, if there's guides free free to go with us, they go with us, but uh, we, we roll with our own crew, um, but they, they definitely do provide a lot of access uh, to land and that sort of thing. Um, Oklahoma, definitely hunt with a guide a lot down in Oklahoma, just for the fact that a lot of ground is leased up. Um, whether it's it's year long leases or people are day leasing fields, um, that can definitely be tough and, and a little frustrating if you're trying to freelance. But it uh, so it just it really depends on the area. Um, I guess kind of going back to the previous question, uh, my role um, with the group is to just kind of help organize some of that. Um, you know, if Fred's got to go to the shot show or something, host some of the shows. Um, and just kind of help out where is needed. Awesome. Awesome. So what is the, what's the team look like? You know, I think we're all pretty familiar and I really enjoyed, I can't remember which episode it was, but 
It was when everyone was talking about waking up, and I think you were – I can't remember what it was, but – uh, the cameraman was, he was in on, like, you got to see the cameraman for a little bit. And uh, I was just kind of curious, you know, what's the, what's the whole team look like? So, <clears throat> I mean, you, you obviously have Fred Lee, the kind of the, the man in charge. Um, Brian Plows is the uh, kind of the head camera guy, producer, um, kind of depending on the area. There's, there's a handful of different freelance guys that will work, um, also. And it, it, like I said, it all depends on the area, kind of who, who chips in and when, um, sometimes there's, there'll be somebody that comes from the shop down just, uh, there's so many different, uh, moving parts to that. But Brian Piles typically does all the, uh, all the production. Um, when we're done hunting and going in, you know, everybody's back in the office, but there'll be anywhere from a minimum of two up to three camera guys per a hunt. Um, and it kind of depends on the group of guys that, that we're hunting with that day. Maybe they have some clients booked and we have, you know, get a hunt with them or, or we get to have more of our buddies out on the hunt that, uh, those factors definitely change every day that we, we go out. But you have Fred and three camera guys, uh, on average is kind of the, the core group. Okay, cool. And how does, uh, what's the dynamic in the, in the blind? Like are, are the, the, you know, you, you talked about, uh, was it Brian you said? Uh, is he, yeah, Brian Plows. Is he calling a, a lot of shots with you guys? Um, you know, he, <laughs> he uh, so the, the best thing about um, filming with those guys is that everybody's a, definitely a professional. Um, they're they're at the top of their game, and and those camera guys uh, they get all they need. You, there's no reenactments, um, in, in on basically on any of the shows. Will you see a reenactment? Um, maybe a dog thing here or there, but it's, it's everything is filmed as it happens. Um, and you also, the, the camera guys won't call the shots. Um, either Fred or I typically, if I'm there, um, I'll call some, some of the shots. Fred typically handles that. He, he has such an eye for, for knowing what the camera's getting, um, and when to call the shot. That's it, It's something you really, you don't just jump in the, in the blind the first time you're doing a TV show and have that uh, know exactly when to call that shot. It's it's uh, definitely something you got to learn, and and it's it's taken me a couple of years to always kind of really you know fine tune exactly when you want to call that shot to make sure you get plenty of the birds working the decoys uh, and backpedaling over the decoys because you need them to hover for for two to three four seconds, um, which you, you know after one second you're wanting to kill them. So yeah. it, uh, it's definitely a little different, but, uh, once you kind of learn the, the nuances of it, it, uh, it's not so bad. Yeah. So how does that bleed over into your personal hunting life? Um, you know, you're hunting on camera, you're hunting off camera. Um, is there anything that bleeds over or is there any, you know, is there a relief for you and there, there aren't cameras there? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's really not that bad hunting in, in front of the cameras all the time. Um, the only time it kind of makes a difference is when you know that um, you know pretty quick whether it's going to be a TV day or not. Um, so when you don't have the cameras around and you and it's it's not a TV day, so maybe those ducks aren't quite finishing exactly how you want, or or maybe only two or three or four or five out of the the thirty or forty that are working are finishing. So you go ahead and shoot those instead of waiting for the big group. Um, there's definitely some some things there that uh, is a little different, but. The uh, I guess the most frustrating part is when you're trying to film a TV show and the birds aren't wanting to be on TV that day. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I can. I can imagine. Not um, everybody wants to be a TV star, or not all the ducks, I guess. Yeah. So they they definitely don't want to be TV stars. So. No, if they're a TV star, it uh, typically doesn't end well. Right. Right. Um, what about um, okay? So some of the B roll. I know you said that they kind of just uh, they're professionals and they just they go in there and they can capture pretty much everything as is. Um, when it comes to shooting intros and things like that, how does that how does that play into the whole uh, season? 
So all the typically a lot of the intros are filmed. Um, you kind of have your you have your hunt that you have filmed, and and as you're going into the hunt, you kind of anticipate things. So you, you take a break from maybe setting the decoys for a second, and you do a thirty second to a minute intro of kind of what's going on, what you're doing, what you're uh, setting up for, what you think the birds will do. You then kind of throughout the hunt, you'll you'll do little updates. After the hunt, you kind of wrap it up. Um, and then typically at some point early in the spring, uh, you can go, go to the, uh, the call shop, um, and Fred will do the actual intros to the hunt. He'll, he'll talk a little bit more about, um, where we're at, what, what exactly we're doing, maybe some weather patterns, uh, what we've been experiencing, maybe hit, hit on a few more things. Um, that's kind of how we, we handle all that. Most of that is done, uh, in the field and, and, You'll notice on the on the new shows this year, all the intros are different. So they, uh, there's not one just stock intro for, for all the shows, um, which I think is kind of a cool thing to do. So do you guys try to capture some of those moments that are, you know, the dull moments or the not-so-good moments uh, as far as to kind of add in a little realism for the audience and kind of keep it real? Um, we'll definitely do, uh, especially we're in the truck, uh, we'll talk about, um, you know, maybe it's been cloudy and calm for, for a couple of days. So we'll kind of explain what we're doing. Um, and, and maybe, you know, that we ha- haven't been able to hunt for a couple of days and, or the birds just aren't working. Um, uh, typically we don't add a lot of that into the show, uh, as far as showing the, the hunts themselves, but we, uh, we definitely do talk about them. I kind of want to get into the traveling portion of it, the the long haul, the longer haul ones that you guys do. Um, you kind of want to give us a like, how does that go out? You know, everybody kind of you guys caravan. Uh, do you link up at certain? You know, you just link up at the lodge together or uh, or the hotel. Um, there's definitely a caravan. Um, a lot of times, um, I'm the first stop on that trip, so. They'll, uh, everybody shows up to my house. Um, I built a, a hunting lodge here four or five years ago. Um, it's really nice. We can, we can pull the truck and trailer inside. It's, it's heated. Everybody can, awesome. can come in. We can get kind of organized. Um, if there's new faces in the group for the, uh, for that trip, we can go through that. Um, we typically will hang here for three to seven days. Um, and then from that point on, there, there'll probably just be uh, two vehicles going out after that, um, one of camera guys and one of hunters. Um, and typically, we try to stay places where uh, where we don't have to stay in hotels, but that's not always the uh, the case. So we'll uh, we'll crash kind of wherever need be. Awesome. Um, so what's the what's the wake up look like uh, in the morning? Who's the who's coordinating all the wake ups? Who's uh, it uh, the wake ups on after about day fifteen the wake ups can be a little rough. Um, yeah. It uh, you know thankfully those guys um, the, the camera guys are so good you, you we don't have to be out there two hours early to set up cameras and go through that process. Um, really can we try and get we want to be fully set up. Um, really 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes before we're ready to shoot. Uh, you know, if it's a, maybe an afternoon hunt, we try and maybe get set up an hour before, um, just so you can maybe do some a little extra on the interviews, uh, do some, maybe do some dog work, that sort of thing. Um, but the, yeah, the, the wake up can be, uh, everybody, everybody's a little different on how they get up and, and I, I'm get up. I get up, and in five minutes, I'm out the door. As long as I got got a little coffee. Some people yeah. need to be up an hour early, you know. That's me. I got to be up and and checking everything and get my get my whole cup and a half of coffee in. And so, yeah, it's uh, everybody's a little different. So it uh, you'll definitely about an hour before we're, we're leaving, you'll you'll start to see some lights turn on and, and people moving around. Yeah, Brad, so since we're talking about traveling, can you give me uh, your favorite place you've hunted as far as, you know, the hunting experience and then as far as, like, landscape and and nature? You know, know, I really, really like to hunt. Um, 
northwest Saskatchewan, just the rolling hills, and and it's it's the beginning of the fall migration. Um, their harvest is going on at the same time, or, or maybe you're kind of at the tail end of harvest. There's there's just a lot going on, and, and for me, it's that first sign of fall and, and knowing what you know what to expect when we get home. Um, but that first trip to Canada of the year is always, it, to me, it's just a blast, and it, and that's it. Uh, it's probably besides my home area, it's my favorite place to hunt. Yeah, nice. Yeah, you got me excited now. So <laughs> it's there. Uh, no, nothing says you know duck season than like like going up to uh, Saskatchewan the first week of October. But it, even with that said, um, you know central north central Oklahoma late season. Um, the one drawback to Canada, I guess, is you're not always shooting greenheads; you're shooting brown ducks. But yeah. go to uh, late season central north central Oklahoma is, is phenomenal hunting as well and. Um, a little more what I'm used to in Southeast Kansas. Right. Right. Uh, so what, what's some of the, what's the best part about your job as a a hunting TV show host? You know, the people we go with, um, it's, it's awesome to meet new people. Um, typically we, we get to hunt the best places. Um, that's, I mean, when you, when you have, you combine good people and great duck hunting. I mean, it's, it just doesn't get any better than that. Um, it, just to just to get all those experiences that, without doing the TV show, I would I would never be fortunate enough to do. Yeah, uh, what's what's the worst part of, of your job as a hunting TV show host? There uh, there's been some some stretches where you know you're out for for a week and and really there's you know it, it's cloudy. You know the wind's not blowing. Um, you'll notice on on almost every, besides maybe on some goose hunts, um, all the duck hunts are filmed in sunshine. So sunshine and wind. And when you don't have that, and you're uh, just kind of at the lodge twiddling your thumbs after you've been scouting, and there's not a whole lot to do. That uh, that can start to wear on a guy after four or five days. What's uh, you want to tell us a little bit about this last season? Um, maybe a little bit. You know, what were some funny, interesting highlights, um, some behind-the-scenes stuff uh, that maybe we, we won't get to see? You know, we uh, – so the, the one thing we didn't do this year, we, we didn't go to Canada. Um, so we came – what the like like the last several years, the first trip of the year was uh, here at my place. Um, I didn't get to go on uh, on the, the longer road trip of, uh, you know, late December through January. Um, had to stay home and get uh, get some more work done, but we had it, we had the darnest time here. Um, I called Fred, told him you know we're absolutely covered up in birds. Um, I've called him and told him that I don't know how many times he's come down and we've just absolutely had phenomenal hunt. He shows up shows up the night you know uh, the night before the hunt. We go out and hunt for three days, and it's terrible. Um, the, the conditions are perfect, but for some reason, the ducks just absolutely will not do anything that we need them to do. Um, they leave, they go to Oklahoma. They, I call him and say, Hey, we were, you know, things have changed a little bit. We're, we're covered up again. Get back here. Same thing happens again for three or four days. Um, it, it, it was just, uh, it just didn't work out. So they leave, they go back to Oklahoma and they hunted a little, uh, some of central Kansas. Why he's gone. We're absolutely slaughtering the ducks every day. We're shooting limits. Um, I call him, told him, you know, I have a couple spots lined up that look like great TV show spots. They come back. Same thing happens again. So it, uh, that was probably the worst part thing about this season was, uh, every time I thought I had a great deal lined up, um, you know, it just, it would fall completely apart as soon as he would leave. The hunting picked up and, and it was phenomenal. Um, and that happens more often than not when you, when you're traveling, they, uh, you know, these, your, your, your buddies are out scouting, they're finding birds. You show up and just whatever it is that happens, um, something about the camera showing up in the, in, in the area, the birds just disappear. They, they, completely stop their patterns or it's always something a little off that just seems to happen and and uh, you kind of got to regroup 
So you you mentioned something there that was pretty interesting to me, um, and that was that you said, "Hey, I got some good TV spots," and I, you know, a lot of times. So when I'm scouting, I don't I'm not thinking about how visually appealing is this um, this little cattle pond that I'm about to you know. There's tons of birds loaded up on it. How much does that play into your scouting? Um, it plays in. Um, so I yeah, I've grown up hunting in this area uh, for the last. You know, I've duck kind of in this area 20 years um, and know it, um, I mean, know it as well as I feel like probably anybody, maybe probably don't. But normally when I find a spot, um, I guess I just kind of have a mental checklist of, of things I go through to, uh, you know, the hide, where can, where can we put camera guys, what's, what's the wind direction going to be, what's the sun, you know, where's you know, how the sun's going to play and all that. Um and, and just kind of looking at it from from doing the TV shows for so many years, knowing what how we're probably going to to hunt this pond, how it's going to set up for filming, um, and what it's just something that um, you know you start you, you scout you know you find a great spot to hunt, um, but it takes a, it takes a really really good duck hunt to make an average TV show. Um, and I think that's probably what a lot of people maybe don't understand when they're watching, um, it, you know, the AVNX TV show is, is if you were on that hunt, they, um, you, it's, they're phenomenal duck hunts. Um, it, like I said, it takes a really, really good duck hunt to make an average TV show. Right. So there's just, there's just little things I guess I look for, um, to try and figure out if it's a good place to film or not. Okay, so back onto the travel thing a little bit. And I know, um, I, well, at least from the way it's uh, shown on TV, uh, it looks like Fred packs the uh, the trailer and then they, they head on out. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what goes into a good pack out on, on these trailers? And, you know, what oh are my. some of the lessons you've learned? There's a, there's a reason they have a 24-foot, 8-foot uh, wide Vino's trailer. Um, the front, the front probably quarter of the trailer is, uh, is just access. It's, it's just for camera guys, um, to keep their gear organized away from all the hunting equipment. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get damaged. Um, but it's, uh, it's not, a, it's not a, let's load the trailer up and be gone in an hour process. Um, there's so much equipment, um, specifically camera equipment to load, um, that, you know, that's going from the trailer into the shop and then it, you know, it needs to go back out, but it needs to be organized. It needs to be labeled so that, uh, at three 30 in the morning, it's easy to find. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lengthy process. Thankfully, um, I've only had to do that once or twice. Um, I've helped reload the trailer numerous times after, uh, after we've got it out here, um, I, I'm definitely fortunate that normally I get to, if it's too far, I get to jump on an airplane and fly there and everything's just magically loaded in the trailer and, and, and ready I to go. i got a couple buddies that do something similar like that. So <laughs> yeah, it's uh don't, they don't have to travel with a gun, no shells, no nothing. Just show up. Nice. It's uh that's not typically my style, but uh, when, when, especially when we go to Canada, that's uh that's how I, so who's that. the, who's the trailer boss? Uh, definitely Fred. Um, Fred's got the back, and and Brian's got uh, the front of the trailer. Um, they're they're both the uh, the king of their domains in there. Everything's organized very specifically. And now, is there a, a big wipe your shoes kind of no mud in the trailer uh, type of policy going on? I know that one of my buddies that's kind of um, his trailer rolls. Oh no. It, uh, the back is kind of just uh, get it okay. loaded. It needs to be organized, but get it loaded. The camera guys are definitely a little more oh, picky. Sure. They're, they're concerned about dust oh, all yeah. the time. Makes absolute, absolute sense. So, Oh, it does. It does. After after being around the camera equipment and, and seeing all the – just the little details of things you have to do, I, I completely understand why uh, – why they're, they're, they're they are the way they are. I was, you know, and I was. Uh, this just comes <laughs> very different uh, of filming style. You know, I've got the GoPro and the iPhone that I set up behind us so that we can capture um, some of our 
some of our hunts and I'm always like, Hey, move to the left over here. You know, we got to move the blinds over here. Cause this is the, you know, all that stuff. And I was, I always, you know, wondered how much, um, the camera guys actually, you know, get to interject if there is any, I know you said they just kind of, they show up and they, they are very good at capturing all that stuff. Is there any instances where it's been like, Oh, gotta, gotta do what Brian says or anything like that. Oh no, a- absolutely. They um, they have a, a a lot of say on how that stuff is done. Um, we've all hunted together so long that um, generally we're we're pretty pretty spot on the first time we do it. Um, but you never know exactly. Maybe the ducks are doing something a little bit different. Maybe they're 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 circling in from a different direction than you expected, um, and they're just not quite able to capture exactly what they're looking for. So you need to move blinds, or or maybe they need to move their position a little bit. Um, but no, they have they have a lot of say in, in how to get in how to get uh, I guess the blind set up exactly where they want it to get that best shot, and then where they need to be set up. Uh, you know, the guy outside of the blind. We actually have some mini A-frames um, just for camera guys that we set up uh, elsewhere so they can film from those and be out of the elements also. So kind of on that same element of that, how how do you guys – do you guys ever have trouble with you know, the camera guys getting in the way or flaring birds or anything or you know try to hide – I assume you guys use boom mics. I'm not sure how that whole process works, but trying to hide some of the equipment from, from those birds, especially if you guys are hunting, you know – circling uh, lessers and stuff like that i can see how that can get kind of difficult uh i mean lens flash is definitely the uh i mean the biggest uh, that can flare birds faster than probably anything um all of our all the camera guys are, are really good at hiding uh whether they're wearing ghillie suits they're the little uh little mini a-frames that fred designed um have worked out just great for uh for filming they can film out the end of them they're completely camouflaged there's just the, the small lens sticking out um but with that even it being a nose lens flash can absolutely uh flare a flock of anything as fast as as fast as you know somebody's face sticking out of a blind so the uh what we'll try and do is if we feel like it's it is lens flash you know from the lens you know coming across the sun we'll uh, we'll try and kind of get an idea of exactly where that angle is and make sure that the camera guys maybe don't film past that angle if at all possible um or we you know we'll move their blind if need be um but it uh typically it's something else than the camera guys um that you know if if maybe the birds are flaring but it uh if it's the camera guys it's it's almost always lens flash Gotcha. And you mentioned lens flash for the, for the listeners. Can you kind of explain, you know, what that is, you know, for those who may not know exactly what um, you're talking about. You, so, you know, as, as the camera guys are following the birds around, uh, as they're circling and when that lens hits the, uh, hits the sun just right, it is, um, it, it's, it's like a strobe light going off and, and it is very bright and the birds will flare almost every time. Nice. So gotcha. Um, What's uh, what's the funniest thing that's ever happened while you guys were out filming? Um, we've had, uh, I think that probably the, the the funniest or the best argument we've ever had. Um, a few years ago, we were hunting next to a little lake, um, and, and it was a blizzard. The birds uh, were flying in all day. We got set up. Uh, we actually had to push some birds out of the field. Uh, the snow came in a lot sooner than we expected. And, and we actually shot a really nice mallard pintail hybrid. Absolutely no idea who shot this bird and the argument that ensued to see who was going to get it. Um, I, I wish they would have filmed it. It was probably really entertaining um, after the fact. But I will say that it's mounted in my shop. <laughs> awesome. So it sounds like you won. Um. I, I uh I, I won by default because uh, I, I guess the, everybody was at my place, so I, I won the argument. But it um, th- that uh, that was probably one of the, the most priceless things that have happened. So I wonder about this. Too. Uh, it, it, um, I know that whenever we like film with GoPros or anything like that, everybody sticks around um, at the house to like, hey, pull up quickly, pull them up, you know, pull up the the videos. Do you guys get to do any of that after the hunt, or is it kind of like? Yeah, that all gets sorted out in, you know, professional post-production. 
Uh, so the guys will come back in. They'll uh, they've got, uh, and I don't know all the terminology, um, but they have large um, storage devices that they'll put all the uh, all the video on. Um, and as it's uploading, you do uh, you do get to watch it. It'll come in all the different clips. Um, you know, if maybe something kind of unique ha- happened during the hunt, um, you get to look for it. Uh, and maybe get a watch that, but we don't watch just a ton of it. Um, I remember back in the day when everything was done on tapes, um, and you absolutely watched nothing back, unless it was like a uh, maybe a miss hit on a deer, uh, just for fear of uh, the tape being ruined um, or taping over a tape, which has happened uh, a lot. So that's the best thing about digital storage. If you uh, you don't tape over anything, it's hard to ruin those files. However, it, it, that can happen, but it's typically not done because you're watching them. Um, but if it's a if it's a real slam dunk of a hunt, you bet we're back at the shop watching. <laughs> awesome. So, Brad, do you have, do you have a favorite bird that you like to shoot or favorite species? Uh, um, you know, for me, uh, shooting mallards. Um, you're shooting greenheads in my in my local area is still my favorite place to hunt. Um, really fortunate, like I said, you know, I talked about having that river bottom access um, earlier in the show, and I mean that some of my very first duck hunts happened down the river late season. It was really cold. Um, you know, my dad would take us out there and, and carry us across the river and set us up, and, and we'd shoot ducks till we couldn't feel our fingers, and we'd go home. But it um, that was some of my fondest memories are down there, and, and almost all the hunting we do here locally, it's, it's almost all mallards. Um, you'll get some farm ponds that have uh, have some gad walls or maybe some teal on them, but for uh, for the most part, I'd say ninety eight percent of the ducks we shoot are all mallards. So. Okay. Go ahead. And that that's even with shooting all mallards, it's still it's still my favorite duck. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't really had a lot of experience with mallards being over here in North Carolina. We got a lot of wood ducks, but not too many mallards. So, you know, I haven't really had my experience like that yet, but I've heard I've heard great things. So I'm excited oh, yeah. to come. Yeah. Come to- I've I've been to uh to North Carolina up by uh Murfreesboro to, to chase black ducks a couple of times. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Plenty so. of those, but no no mallards. Close, but no you know, yep. no cigar there. Yep. Uh, for sure. What is uh what is your dream hunt except guess for like the whole crew or, or you specifically to go on? Um, you know, I'd really like to go to the uh the west coast, shoot uh Harlequins and Brant. Um that's kind of a hunt that uh, I'm looking forward to putting together in the next couple of years. Um you know, the vast majority of decoy sales are mallards. Uh, and puddle ducks, I guess, in general. So that's what we focus on. But um, I, I've never been to the West Coast. I've been to the East Coast. Um, been all over Canada, um, all over the Midwest, but I have not been to the West Coast, and that's definitely something on the bucket list for that I uh, want to happen sooner than later. A lot yeah, of times definitely. for me, um, the weather can really make or break a hunt for me or, or really set the you know that hunt apart and I, I'm kind of a guy like the the worse the weather, um, the better. I, I enjoy it. And I think some of my favorite hunts of your guys' that I've watched are the ones where it's overcast and there's a there's some thick or light snow coming, you know, and you can just see the birds kind of popping out of the out of the snow. I, that's that's my favorite kind of hunt. What's your favorite kind of weather? Um, mallards in the sunshine over uh, small bodies of water. Um, that, that's definitely my favorite. I've actually, um, I've been kind of working on, I've started developing my own properties, um, just for that. Uh, just there, there are little three to five acre flooded cornfields kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, three to five acres really isn't that big. Uh, a three acre, a three acre flooded cornfield, you can pretty much shoot the whole thing from one spot. Right. And once, uh, now that I've got uh, a couple of those established, we'll be able to, uh, you know, a nice high pressure, ten mile an hour, uh, sunny day is that uh, it just doesn't get any better than that for me. Or I want it to be a, a blizzard. Awesome, yeah. I I just love those episodes where 
um, you guys are, you know, in the A-frame or in one of the hard blinds and, and the snow is coming in and everyone's, you know, really straining to kind of see the birds and it just calling like crazy. That's that, – that gets it going for me. Oh, it's uh, – you know, we we haven't had a lot of snow uh, really this kind of the sa- southern, uh, you know, southern Kansas, Oklahoma hasn't had a lot of snow in the last few years. Um, so we haven't had a lot of opportunity for those types of hunts, but in previous years where we did get those snows, that uh, there's just there's that's a lot of fun to shoot. You know, you get a nice kind of oh, I say nice. It's really a nasty cold front coming in, and, and it's snowing, and and those birds are really out feeding heavy. Uh, those are, I mean, those those are the hunts that you remember for a lifetime. Yeah. Um, on average, how many how many days of the season do you say you go out? Uh, I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't hunt any less than five days a week. Um, you know, that's, and I guess that's our local season, um, you know, Southeast Kansas season, right. um, you know, try and go to Canada once a year, um, maybe, you know, spring snows, uh, for sure. That's, uh, so it kind of just depends, but, um, I'd say at least five days a week. Okay. And, you know, typically, when someone's spending five days um, a week out hunting, they uh, they pick up a few things that us weekend guys don't necessarily get to. Um, what what would you say is the besides scouting is the number one thing that you could advice that you could give a hunter in his first or second season that's just starting to get his legs under him and, and figure things out. You know, you know. Besides scouting, scouting is is no doubt the most important. Um, but concealment, uh, I see a lot of people where they they probably they get a little lazy. Um, the best thing that I bought myself was a gas powered hedge trimmer. Hmm. Um, I remember the days of uh, putting on gloves and and pulling grass. Um, I mean, and you you would pull grass for an hour, and it was, and you'd you'd sit there and look at your blind and think, I need to go pull grass for another hour and and do this again. Um, I bought, I bought a little steel gas powered hedge trimmer and and in 10 minutes you can have enough grass to cover five blinds, um, and and still have something, you know, still have grass left over to keep, you know, adding, adding somewhere. Um, so concealment, I, I do think is, is probably number two. Um, you know, if you're, for me hunting small bodies of water, uh, if you don't have a lot of decoys, even if, you know, if you just have a dozen or I, I hunted multiple days uh, last year with just a dozen decoys and had three of them on a jerk cord and had great hunts. Um, so if you can have a, I don't, I rarely use a spinner um, unless I just absolutely feel it, it might be necessary, but uh, concealment, you know, some sort of motion. I really like jerk cords, huge fan of them. Um, there's a reason that they've been used for, for so long and, and they're, cause they're, they're that effective that effective you kind of just made my i'm shaking my head right now because as i as i you know hunt just a couple days a week it's no it's not a real big deal for me to go out and and pull grass um you know to throw on the blind and you know normally i don't end up doing that normally i'm bringing new people out and i always kind of give them uh that's one of you know their tasks and i'm just kicking myself right now because i have one of those in my garage and why I've never thought of using it. Okay. <laughs> that will be making the trip. Uh, it will. Um, I mean, so maybe it's not going to occupy those, uh, the newbies quite as long as maybe you're hoping it was, but it is uh, hands down uh, one of the most useful tools a waterfowl hunter can have in this trailer. If that's the one tool besides just your normal waterfowl hunting equipment, that is the uh, that is the number one item in the trailer. Oh, um, man, it, it makes life so easy. Yeah, I'm just sitting here, kind of shaking my head, thinking how you know how have I never have I not thought of that? I'm a man of many yard tools as well. So, yep, yeah, it's I'm telling you, it's they're they're effective, and it when you you can just have so much grass, you can really break out. Um, 
you know, like on your A-frames, if you're not in grass that's maybe, you know, say a foot or taller, you can really um, start to kind of feather the edge at the bottom of the blinds because you have, I mean, you can get so much grass so fast. You can start to feather all your edges, your sharp edges out. Um, and those are little details that I think uh, maybe the newbies kind of miss. Um, and, and it's just they haven't learned it yet or they haven't had somebody teach them. Um but there's just, you know, especially late season, you really, you've got to break up your hard lines and, and just kind of help blend blend all those things together. For the naysayers, I guess, tricks and tips um, for using like A-frames and, and stuff. I've never really used them, so I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I've never, I don't have any uh, say in it, so. So we, um <clears throat> When Fred first bought, brought the A-frames down here to hunt, we, um, you know, we we had hooked two of them together and hunt, and then he came back the next year and he said, "Man, we found out literally the more of these we tie together that are properly covered, the the more it's like the the birds just have that much more confidence finishing into them. It, it all of a sudden becomes, you know, just from a blind to." literally you're making your own little grass row and and so i've used um we've hunted some cattle ponds that um i mean the the grass was literally two inches around it uh tall and and hooked three or four of them together and the ducks finish into them like it's they they have they don't even care so there there was hardly any cover and and the more, literally, the more of them you, you put together that are properly concealed, properly concealed, um, it just gives the birds more confidence to finish into them. Um, with that being said, um, if you have one blind and, and you feather edges and, and do things, I mean, it's. I, I haven't laid in a, in a ground blind in probably five six years. Oh man, um, I they're my back really appreciates that. So what technique do you guys use for feathering in uh, a ground blind or, or not a ground blind? I'm sorry. Uh, one a frame, a frame. Um, so there's, there's a couple of different types of grass. There's a, there's called a prairie, prairie reed grass that uh, we found that kind of works the best. It's really durable, but um, really it's what, I, and, it, and the, the best thing about the prairie reed grass is, is its color is very kind of a neutral tan. It blends in a, with about anything, but um, putting a good base of grass on your blind, and then once you get to wherever you're going, take your hedge trimmer, go cut a bunch of, of grass that is, you know, obviously right there, um, not exactly where you're hunting, just a little ways away, and bring that in and finish out your blinds. And, and doing that every hunt, is, I think, is very important, whether it's, um, you know, for instance, we were goose hunting up by Manhattan last year, and, and around this field had a bunch of, uh, um, I, they're, they're big weeds, but they were five, six, seven foot tall, and we had none of them on our blinds, but in uh, the blinds kind of stuck out as soon as we grabbed those sticks and just kind of added the local vegetation into them, they absolutely disappeared. And we had a phenomenal honker hunt um, that day, but it's so a good base of grass. Once you get set up, add some, some local vegetation. Um, if you, like I said, if, if you feel like maybe the grass is too short, you know, maybe put some on the, some grass on the uh, on the ground on the front and back, and maybe on the each side, each end of the blinds, um, just to kind of get rid of that sharp edge. Um, is by far, I, I believe the best way to do it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So going back to the A frames again, I've I've heard a lot of people, and like I said, I've not I don't have much experience with them, but I've heard a lot of people say that you can't use them over and over again. You just it it you know birds will stop coming in, and you know they won't even give you a second look. Uh, how would you, I guess, uh, how would you, you know, kind of defer the naysayers with your experience? I know you guys hunt all the time and use them all the time. So, you know, obviously. You know, we, hunt, we, uh, we had a, a particular field last year. We hunted for off and on for two weeks straight. Uh, and we were not the only people hunting that field. Everybody was hunting it with A-frames, and we killed ducks out of that. And it was just a, it was a corn stubble field, so the stubble was maybe a foot and a half tall at best. Um, but we hunted, essentially that field was hunted nearly every day for two weeks out of A-frames, and birds were consistently shot 
every day. Um, I've used a frames from hedgerows to, you know, the cattle pond I told you about. I mean, they, they was completely grubbed down. Hardly any grass is more dirt than grass. Um, I've put them in more in places I never thought it would work, and they just consistently produce. Um, and, you know, this is into late season. It's not just early season that this is happening. This is, you know, all the way through the end of January. Um, the biggest thing is just brushing them in and getting them brushed in. And, and, and I see a lot of people early season, their blinds look great. Um, by middle, mid season, they start to look a little shaggy by the end of season. They really look shaggy. Um, instead of maybe, you know, taking that evening and going and cutting some more grass and, and, you know, sprucing their blinds up a little bit, um, they're off doing something else. But, um, that's, you know, if you keep your blinds freshened up, you'll be, there's, there's hardly any situation you can't use them in. Now question. I think it was like a steam pond you guys were hunting out in Western Nebraska or I can't remember or Colorado. Colorado. Um, I think Fred talked about how all they, all you guys had to do, you ended up adjusting the A-frame, uh, canting it off a little bit so that the it didn't cast as much of a shadow. Correct. So I, uh, I uh, unfortunately wasn't on that hunt, but it's something that we definitely do. Um, you know, if the birds are typically going, you're going to set up where the birds typically will work out in front of you, not to where they're going to work behind you. On, you know, that's not always, but that's best case scenario. Right. Um, the one drawback to the A-frame is it will cast more of a shadow than than a, a ground blind, of course. Um, but with that, there's things you can do to maybe um, the angles of the blinds, that they, so that the sun is uh, there's no shadow in front of the blind. Um, late in the evening or early, early in the morning, there can be a pretty good shadow. So if you adjust the angles of the blind uh, to where there's never that, that shadow, uh, you know, there's always going to be a point that you, you can't adjust anymore. But for the most part, you can always adjust that blind to where that, you know, the sun's going to be on front of them and there's no shadow. Um, you know, what we found is there can be shadows on the ends, there can be shadows behind you. But if you can eliminate the shadow in front of you, um, the birds will almost always finish right into them. Okay, so that's what you really need to watch for on the shadows is having the shadow not cast in between you out and the front. Birds. Okay. Correct. Correct. That is uh, exactly. I'm glad you brought that up. The one thing that I really do like about the A frames is there's a lot more community to be had in it. You get to talk, you get to hang out, um, and there's more. <laughs> Uh, there's more space for doing there's communal stuff. No, you're exactly right. Um, you know, my dad, for instance, he's 59 years old. Um, he's farmed all his life. Doesn't have, doesn't have the best back. Um, and when I first started having the A frames, you know, I'd call him and say, Hey dad, we're going to go hunt in the morning. You want to tag along? And he, the first question, um, out of his mouth was, well, are you going to be in A frames or layout blinds? And, and what he really was getting at was if we're in the A-frames, he's going. If we're in the ground blinds, he's not going. Um, and it's just comfort. I mean, you can, you can, the A-frames, you can have a heater in there if it's, if it's too cold. Um, and everybody's, you know, your shoulders, you know, you're, you know, we, a lot of times we'll run three to four people per blind and you're, you're just in there, you're cutting up, um, giving everybody a hard time and the com- camaraderie definitely seems a little better than, uh, when you're in that little group, um, more so than other situations that maybe you're in. But uh, I, as far as comfort level, they can't be beat as far as a portable ground or a portable blind. Um, you know, you have a nice chair to sit on. I, I guess not everybody does. Some people just have, have a bucket to sit on. But um, we use a lot of the little tri stools uh, mm-hmm. that maybe you'd use in a ground blind for bow hunting. But uh, those are really comfortable. They don't take up a lot of space. They give you back support. Um, just, it, it, I, I think a, a frames are just hands down better than anything on the market right now. And the one thing that you just said there about the heaters, um, especially if you if you've got a poor man a frame like me, where it's it's just uh, plastic, you know, fencing with grass zip tied to it. I can't run a heater in there, or you know, we won't have a pro- we won't even have a blind. <laughs> because yeah. of uh, all the all the it just go up and smoke, but I think that is that is one thing that uh, we're we're saving up for uh, an A frame right now, just so that we can 
try to get the girls out a little bit more. And, uh, um, you know, I got a, I got a four month old right now and, you know, I want to be able to, uh, take her out when she's a little younger. <laughs> and Oh yeah, exactly. And that's, um, you know, just like that. So a, a good friend of mine, Jason Vitt, has a little brother. We took him out hunting last year. It was a nasty day. Um, the high was about 25. The wind was blowing about 25 to 30. Um, we were actually hunting kind of a, a larger pond that was about 20 acres in size. Um, but the birds would work all the way, you know, they'd work all the way across it to, to try and get out of the wind to come up to us. But uh, his brother's seven years old. And he's comfortable in the A-frame. We had a heater going, and he shot a limit of ducks um, and, and just as happy as could be and, and very comfortable in what typically would be really nasty conditions. Who was the who was the little kid that you guys had on there? It was a river hunt, uh, an icy river hunt, and uh, shot a ring neck, I think, and, and y'all were cutting it up about, uh, you know, oh, hey, making bets on how quick he could clean that ring neck or whatnot. Yeah, we, uh, so the, one of the, the ice, really nasty icy river hunts I recall is, uh, we had young, you know, Fred's son Gunner, um, who, who's not, uh, near as little as he used to be. Um, you know, I, I remember him, he was, you know, 12 years old and, and just an ornery little fart and, and not very big. And, and I go and see him and now he's six, three and, and huge. And I, I can't pick on him anymore. Uh, isn't it funny how they do? I got little cousins that you know did that with, or or you know little neighbor kids that it's like, oh, I might want to think twice about giving you a noogie or something. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And he's he's definitely one of them. <laughs> but yeah, definitely one of them. Well, what what's your favorite episode? If if you had to pitch, say, hey. You know, I, I'm only going to watch one episode of your guys's. What one should I watch? Um, <clears throat> there's going to be a couple really, really good uh, Oklahoma hunts coming up. Uh, we had a phenomenal stretch down there uh, of limits. Um, uh, you know, we, we hunted with some clients um, that got you know that helped kind of get some extra birds killed on camera. Um, but look for those; those hunts are great. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't get a hunt, uh, when Fred was hunting back at home, but, uh, you know, so those hunts turned out great. And, and if you kind of listen to the narrative of the hunt, uh, he talks about, there's no place like home to hunt. Um, and, and I definitely get that feeling and, and this is kind of, I guess, land restrictions get, you know, it's harder and harder to get on ground. You have to lease or own and, and, uh, that that's what I'm trying to do, I guess, by developing my own little properties. I, I don't have any property that I can develop and have a 50 acre flooded cornfield, but I can do small three to five acre areas that uh, are maybe, you know, four or five, six, even 10 miles away from a traditional hunting area, but the, they should really produce. And uh, I, I want to be able to come back home um, and, and have good hunting as much as possible and not have to worry about leasing land and, and doing those things. But with that said, I, I think some of the best hunts are going to be uh, the episodes out of Oklahoma. Okay. Right. What you just said actually leads me into something that I believe in a lot. You know, as you grow as a hunter and a conservationist, um, kind of your, at least for me, kind of your duty to alleviate the pressure off that public land because um, if you're the guy that's getting real serious about it, you know, go take back some of that that private land. Um, you know, turn some of that into good, uh, you know, conservate good ha- habitat and um, alleviate the pressure off the public land. Yeah, I um, I've got two friends, uh, Jamie Johnson and Brian Natalini, that uh, that have kind of showed me how they took small properties. Um, you know, Jamie's is, is just a little over four acres. Brian's is just right at five acres. And, and they're killing a lot of ducks um, on these properties. And they are not what I would call traditional duck areas. But they, um, I mean, they've just, they've done a really good job of managing their wetlands. You know, both of theirs have flooded corn. Um and but I, I do believe as a conservationist, it's you know you, you, there's phases you go through, um, 
and and you go from hunting public, you know, learning how to duck hunt to, you know, then you start scouting off, you know, on the private ground, uh, which is becoming harder and harder as duck hunting gets, you know, a little more popular. Um, and then if, if the opportunity arises for somebody to own private land and then to develop that to where they have a place to go and where maybe where they can take their family and, and get to, I mean, there's a lot of fond memories I have of, of hunting with my dad, um, you know, in a flooded river bottom area and um, over some of our farm ponds. And, and what I hope to do by developing a couple of these spots um, now is, is to be able to um, make it easy access for as, as he gets older and, um, and, you know, as I hopefully have kids one day can take them out there and it, it's, it'll be a little easier hunting um, and it should be really good hunting. But if all, if all goes as planned, not that it always does, but it, um, I guess as you evolve as a hunter, so does your mindset of, of what you're wanting to do and what you're looking to get out of it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of money to be made with all these little cattle ponds and farm ponds. You know, if you've got permission to hunt on these things in the off season, go talk to the farmer or the rancher and, and the landowner and see if, see if you can get in there and, um, Hey, would you mind if I, you know, fenced off a, a portion of this over here? The cows still have access to the water, but kind of keeps them off the bank, um, along this edge so we can get some natural vegetation growing up on, you know, at least a half of it or, or something like that. You know, the, the actual, the NRCS, um, which is a farm, for the most mm-hmm. part, farm organization, yep. they um, they have some really interesting programs where they will actually pay to uh, fence off different farm ponds, and, and you put in uh, waters that you know they have, they run pipes underneath the dam, but uh, it's they have like I said they have some really neat programs to do that. But um, farmers are definitely uh, they need all the help they can get, and yeah. if a guy. Um, you know, I remember growing up, my dad would let some people hunt, but as, as I got older and, and hunted more and more and more, you know, we stopped letting so many people hunt because I was hunting all the time. But uh, there's a lot of hunter, there's a lot of families that don't have hunters in their family, and um, and they'll let people hunt. But it's always nice to have. I know the guys that that kind of gave back to my dad. Whether it was um, there's one guy in particular, his name was Troy Russell. I, I still remember. Um, he always he would he would smoke a ham at Thanksgiving and Christmas and bring it to my dad and just kind of a, as a thank you say hey you know thanks for letting me hunt I really appreciate it and it was those little small small tokens and of gesture that you know that let him keep coming back for so long um, but there's yeah, huge oh yeah and that's where I think a lot of people could probably access more land if they would offer to do that for farmers yeah um, I, I mean I go check fences um, you know anytime I. You know, just this last weekend, found two dead cows, um, you know, called the rancher up and uh, it, it right then and there it was, you know, he's like, man, you know, I, I don't, I don't generally let people hunt on this thing or have good experiences with uh, the people that do hunt on it. But he's like, I, I greatly appreciate that. And, uh, you know, conservation minded people, um, if you're that guy, you can make a lot of uh, long time, you know, <laughs> hunting permissions, if not, you know, Yo, and, and, and the thing about farmers that, um, they don't forget, um, you know, they don't forget the nice things that you've ever done for them. So whether it was five or 10 years ago, whether, you know, whether it was you stopped and helped change a tire for, for their, you know, elderly mother or something, they, um, they never forget those things. And they'll always, they, they remember you when you come back and ask for permission and, you know, if you just stop by in the summer and say, "Hey, I'll, I'll give you one free weekend of work if you let me," you know, duck hunt on your on your ponds, and oh, yeah. and you know, they're probably going to look at you like, "Who is this crazy guy went to work for free just so I can duck hunt on my pond?" <laughs> but you show up and, and you work, uh, give them a good, honest weekend of work, um, you're going to have that place to hunt for for years to come. Um, so that's, as I guess, as things get harder and harder to get permission, um, those are things you can do to, to ease that, you know, I guess you can kind of take down those barriers of farmers not letting people hunt and, and getting you access to that land. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Devin, you want to you wanna pitch him the, the final question? Yeah, so... If you couldn't go on another hunt, but one more, um, 
what would it be, where would it be, who with, and uh, how would it all go down? You know, I would, uh, I've got uh, a handful of really good local buddies that I hunt with, and my dad. Um, We have a place we call the Old Lake. Um, It's not actually been on any TV shows. For some reason, it's never worked out when Fred's here, but it's uh, what I believe to be the prettiest place to duck hunt uh, I've ever been. And when it's right, um, it's a flooded timber spot. Um, It's in our river bottom. Uh, that if I had to take, if you told me I could have one last, that my last duck hunt would be a great duck hunt in there, I would go spend the day in there and, and I would be really satisfied. Um, you know, hunting with friends and family is what it's all about anyways, but, um, that's, that's what I would do. Awesome. Now I'm sure you guys get a ton of requests, uh, or, Hey, I got this really awesome place and, and you have your connections already. But I get, I bet you, I'm just guessing, you get a, a lot of people offering, hey, come out and hunt, you know, this place or anything like that. And my, my follow up question to that would be is, have you guys ever bit on any of those? You know, so that's um, sort of how uh, I met Fred is, um, is, is something similar to that. We had developed a relationship, we hadn't hunted uh, together. And he, just from, from being friends for so long, he, he, uh, you know, he called me on a whim and I, and I was one of those guys that, that offered to, you know, Hey, we have great duck hunting out here. You need to come. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely tough. Um, you, you, it's, it's not tough. I mean, the, the invites are awesome. It, it is, it's really, it, it's great to be invited to go to so many places. Um, however, they don't always turn out, um, as advertised, um, that can sure. be, that can bring things sure be a little tough. Um, but it's, as time goes on, get a little older, you, uh, you're a little better at picking out exactly where you want to go. Um, but it's, uh, that can be, that can be interesting to go to those new places and you're always kind of cautiously optimistic of what's going to happen. Um, but over time, you know, you, you do develop a relationship with these people, whether you see them at shows and, and calling contest or, um, maybe they hunt kind of, maybe, maybe they hunt close to the area you do, but you know, they're just, maybe they hunt east of town and you hunt west of town or something. And, um, you know, a lot of times at, you know, at some point you do meet up with them and you do go hunting and you find out, man, I've really been screwing up. This guy's been inviting me for 10 years to come out here and duck hunt. And this is the first time I, I'm really missing the boat here. So, but there, uh, that, that, that has definitely happened, um, where you maybe you make the wrong call and you go somewhere that you probably shouldn't have went to. It's not uh, as advertised, but uh, it, it's really humbling to, ha- to have all the invites to go out and hunt and, and meet all the new people. Sure, sure. Um, and then when you're on the road, how frequently do you have you know people stopping you at the gas station, or uh, do you ever have to deal with anybody following you to fields or anything like that? You know, we've uh, we've never had much of a problem people following us to fields. Um, lots of time driving down the interstate, people drive by, honk on their horn, waving, uh, or at the gas station, people just genuinely, you know, duck hunters, you know, we can definitely be a little competitive and, and maybe, um, you know, when that other group down the road is, is killing them and we're not, you know, we're, we're a little pissed off cause you know, maybe we had a bad day, but for the most part, duck hunters are great people. They're, they're really great people and they genuinely want to see everybody succeed, um, and that's, you know, you're at the gas station, people, they, they want to know how your day went, if you're killing birds and, and how it's going. Um, so it, it's, it's all been good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, do you have any, uh, any plugs or any final takeaways you want to give to the, uh, to the listeners before we head on out of here? I don't. I, uh, I appreciate you guys having me on, and, and hopefully I shared something that uh, somebody can learn from or find finds a little interesting about filming TV shows and kind of what goes into it. And it uh, hopefully I helped out somewhat. Thank you for having me on, and, and uh, I wish you guys best in your season. Absolutely. You as well. So safe hunting. Uh, thank you. All right. Wanted to give a huge shout-out to our sponsors for bringing you today's show. Uh, first and foremost, we've got Hunt Hickory Creek. If you are looking to not just get on to some birds in central or southeast Kansas, but also looking for the guides 
that are going to go the extra mile to make sure um, that your group of two or your group of 12, whoever it is, um, is going to have fun and they're going to go out there, they're going to scout hard for you, they're going to work hard for you. And Chase and Cody are both in the listener group. And if you want to get a feel for who they are, head in on there and uh, you can you can really see what you're getting with them. Uh, they're also, they've gone way out of their way and they're opening up the... Uh, um, the lodge for the foul front guys. Uh, I think we got two slots left in there, but uh, hopefully next year we'll make it a little bit uh, a bigger of a thing. We can get a couple more people in there since uh, it was such a, a huge hit. But we also want to go ahead and thank um, Dive Bomb Decoys. They did something pretty special for us last week, and they got a lot of our a lot of our budget guys into. Decent sized spreads. Um, went out of their way, gave the listeners of the foul front 25% discount for 24 hours, and uh, it was really something. And it really says a lot about uh, who they are as a company and how they came up and just what they're willing to do for um, not only the guys that have tons of money to, to throw around, but the guys that are just trying to get a, a spread built. So. We really appreciate everything that uh, Asher and Cody, Cody's going to be coming on, uh, the president uh, of the company, is going to be coming on uh, here in a week or two, and he's going to be giving us their, their their lineup, some stuff that they got coming out, and we'll get to know them a little bit better. So once again, thank you to those guys. Uh, we also want to thank Colorado Custom Game Calls. Man, we are just pumped to be affiliated with these guys. Uh, the amount of attention to detail and personal customization you can get in your every single one of these things is its own piece of art. And not to mention, the guts in these things sound real good. Real good. Um, and then you head on over there. Austin, he's also in the group. And he'll tell you, you can get a foul front band. We're going to have a foul front uh, call coming out here shortly. Um, but you can get the foul front band on your next custom um, game call, and that's duck, goose. They actually have a ton of predator calls, I think, and um, a couple other things out there. So real good guys, great calls, super, super cool-looking stuff, um, and brings the birds in. So they got the videos to prove it. We also want to thank FreelanceHuntStats.com. Uh that is something that I'm super excited to be able to track and log all of my hunts this year. Uh, and thanks to Elliot over at Freelance Duck Hunting for starting this freelance uh, huntstats.com. Head on over there. Uh, he's got really good prices right now for um, the memberships. It's, uh, you know, trade one cup of Starbucks a month and you can have all of your hunting statistics at your fingertips. And uh, it, it's it's a sweet app, and he's got a lot of stuff coming out, and I'm super, <laughs> I'm pumped, uh, to be honest with you, to go in there and check out all my variables, and and uh, yeah, just to see, maybe I can you know gain some insights on um, being a better hunter. We'd also like to thank um, Toe Tags LLC. Toe Tags LLC exists to help keep us legal. There's a lot of things people don't know, but um, you have to tag your migratory, migratory game birds, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that, and, you know, not everybody has it readily accessible to just write down, uh, you know, in a piece of Ziploc or a zip tie, and, and for just a few cents a day, you can keep yourself completely legal within the bounds of the law, and, you know, better safe than sorry, and honestly, you do not want to be sorry when it comes to this. Um, we've got Ryan from Toe Tags LLC, the owner over there. He's going to be coming on and telling us his story um, in, in the next couple weeks too. And they make it super easy because all you have to do is just fill out your some of your information on that tag and attach it to either the game strap or the individual bird itself. It's it's pretty awesome. So, uh, And last but not least, we've got DocsOutdoorSupplies.com. Um, They've also got a 10% discount code for you, and that's FOULFRONT18, um, all undercase. And the thing about 
DocsOutdoorSupplies.com that, that I, I like, and besides it being my dad's uh, online outdoor store, is that he gives you the all-in price of what you're looking at. So when you see um, whatever that price is, that's shipping, that's everything, where if you go over to some of these other um, online stores, you know they're going to show you the, the lowest price, and then they're going to add that shipping. They're going to add the taxes. Um, and he does eat some of the shipping uh, sometimes. So... Um, it's I, I just think it's pretty cool, and then especially with that ten percent uh, discount code, and he's got a bunch of motion decoy systems on there, and a bunch of other stuff that is it's just it's a really neat site. So, all right, guys, please go out and support all those companies because they're the ones that keep um, this show afloat and uh, keep this from um, you know taking uh, out of my my daughter's college funds um, that I'm trying to contribute to and really allows me to be able to sit down here and talk to you guys for um, a couple hours a a week and all the editing that goes into it. So please, um, if, if you know, you think you can save a couple bucks somewhere else, um, go check these guys out. Uh, these are people that have a vested interest in the, in the show and in your listenership. So, all right. Uh, now that I've exhausted myself hopefully next week you guys will hear me and i'll have a completely fresh voice and uh, we'll be um 100 healthy so thanks for bearing with me for the last couple weeks um i know it's been rough on you it's been rough on me but all right guys uh, and gals see you shortly thanks for listening to this week's episode of the foul front waterfowl podcast please come join us on our facebook group the foul front waterfowl podcast group where you can connect with a good group of hunters because we're all in this together. We need to act like it so that hopefully our great, great grandkids will be hunting ducks over our favorite public lands. Uh, We also ask that you go ahead and give us a written review on iTunes and give us five stars if you think we deserve it. And we really do want to hear back from you uh, so that we can give you the best possible content. And if you get in on that Facebook group, you can get in there and you can ask questions and you can tell us what you want to hear next or you can tell us uh, what you don't like and we'll be sure to tailor things to our listeners so all right stay safe out there and we will see you next week And another thing too, and maybe maybe what's the what's the nobody's home strategy? I, I remember him talking about it, and I didn't quite understand it. Where they he left some blinds out on the other side or something, and then it, is it do you do you recall that? I think it was. Um, I I don't. Okay, never mind. I don't. We'll, well, I guess we'll cut that part out. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> sorry uh, about I, that. No, that's all right. That's all right. That's fine. Um.